viewed within the context of the three competing positions of regulate to facilitate land grabs, regulate in order to mitigate negative uh, uh, impacts and uh, maximize uh, opportunities, and then uh, regulate to block and roll back land grabs. In that context, in that position, that middle of the road position uh, sits on, on uh, uh, two key assumptions, which is uh, land grab is inevitable anyway, and that uh, redistributive reforms are impossible anyway. Uh, it does not question the fundamental logic underpinning land grabbing today, which is the logic of capital. It does not question that, and uh, it logically leads to an advocacy position that demands changes in the manner of land grabbing, but not in the nature and character of land deals itself. And so that means if we pursue that, and if they are successful in their advocacy work, what we would expect to see are more of the same, more land grabs, but maybe more transparent and consult consultative land grabbing, but land grabbing nevertheless. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I have an important, uh, a serious problem with that kind of position. We define land sovereignty, it's a very uh, work in progress concept. We define it as a working people's uh, right over land as a resource in the territory, uh, as just a conceptual handle because uh, we feel that uh, the, the, the response by social movements to land grabbing, which is a grand reform, is okay, but it's very narrow. It cannot capture the diverse settings uh, uh, where land grabbing occurs in the world today. So it's more of uh, defending the commons, but there are also people who are into private privatized uh, spaces already. So what do we do with that? So it's more of an umbrella concept that would bring in more different uh, social classes and groups in society within a broad front against land grabbing and uh, a construction of a potential uh, uh, alternative uh, for the future.